I was calling on a customer of mine, uh, a very good customer of mine, and I was standing um, talking to her, and while I was talking to her, the, the phone rang, and she picked it up, and she excused herself and picked it up, and of course I was three feet away, so I heard the conversation. And when she ended, she said, of course, just fax us in your layout, and we'd be happy to send you a quote. And when she hung up, I said, Lucy, I wanted to say, are you nuts? But I didn't say that. I said, Lucy, how many times did you ever get a job from a faxed in quote? And she turned to her partner, the, the two desks, and between them, they decided they never got a job that, where they quoted a through fax or email. Never got a job like that. I said, then why did you do it? You have the most beautiful, my name is Wisconsin, you have the most beautiful showroom in Milwaukee. Uh, you've got the granite slabs and you've got the, all the, your faucets and uh, you've got posters and you've got all your edges, you've got everything. If you get them in here, you're going to get them excited and be able to sell the difference between you and the lawn sign guy. When you quote, send that quote out, there's nothing they can do except buy on price. And you know what, Lucy, you're never going to be the best, lowest bidder. You can't be. Not with all this, and you have the right insurance. So she said, well, they'll never come in. I said, you're right, most of them won't come in. But if they do, get, do come in, you've got a chance of selling them. If you do it on the phone, you're not, you just told me you never got them anyway. So quoting on the phone is, is, is my opinion, is a waste of time. Features and benefits. Uh, many sales systems are based on selling features and benefit. Feature being a fact about the product and a benefit being what the customer gets out of it. Granted, it's hard. The hardest product in nature except diamonds. The benefit is it'll last a lifetime. Um, salespeople are taught to uh, link the feature with the benefit. Granted, it's hard which means it'll last a lifetime. The reason so many sales systems use features and benefits, of it, it benefits is it works, but only to a point. You have to be careful with features and benefits. Back when I was selling homes, we had sculptured shingle roofs that the, uh, it, was sculpt, it was sculptured to look like cedar shape. So the feature was it's a sculptured roof. The benefits are it looks like cedar shape and it's got a 45 year warranty. So we were always pushing these two benefits. But what we found out back 10 years ago when I was selling houses, people weren't keeping houses for 10 years. They wanted to get as much money out of that, they wanted to buy the house, let it appreciate for three or four or five years, and then move out and, and go buy another big house. Okay? So when we talked about a 45 year warranty, to them it was a waste of money. Oh, this is too expensive. Okay? So when you're doing features and benefits, that's why the asking questions is so important. When you're talking about features and benefits, and I don't know all the features and benefits of your countertops, but you got to make sure you're not defeating your own purpose by selling against yourself. Presentation. Now, if you're, you've asked all the questions, you know what they want, you've determined their budget, you have all these facts. Somehow you're going to have to put it all together and work up a quote. Maybe it's the next day. Maybe it's, you know, excuse me, I'm going to go in the other room for a few minutes and make up the quote. Whatever your process is, when you come back, they forgot half of you talk, half the stuff you talked about. So you have to start all over. Okay? Now what you told me, and if you're taking notes the whole time, they'll be so impressed you're taking notes because you're listening to them. You told me you want A, B, C, D, E, and list all the things that they said they wanted. And now you sell and you talk how your product that you're recommending meets each one of those needs. Okay? Then when you come to the end and you told me your, uh, your budget was between eight and $6,000. So you made the presentation, you've met every once in a week. Now, here is the, the key here. Don't give out the final price until they say, I want it. And they may not use those words but they'll be leaning forward. They want that product because you've, you've met all the needs. They've never been through that process. They went to the guy down the street and he talked about the price and he talked about the, the, all the features and maybe he talked about the benefits and maybe he didn't, but he talked about him, 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 him. And what you've done is talked about them, 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 them. Okay? So this is new territory for them. At this point, 
if you haven't already, you're going to get some objections. This is one the lady says is the countertop radioactive. It's, pos it's probable that you have about 10 objections that you hear on a regular basis, right? You, you keep nodding your head back there. I'm sorry, your name? My yeah. Jeannie. Jeannie. You probably have about 8 or 10 objections you hear all the time, right? Okay. What you should do is make a list of those objections and script, write out how you're going to overcome each one of those objections. Now, then what that does for you is, first of all, it makes you real confident that you have these things. You know, coming up with unique objections is pretty, is pretty uh, unusual. Now, the nuclear reactive stuff, well, we have the radon issue, and you can get all kinds of articles from the Marble Institute and on all, how that's all blown out of proportion, so you can give them facts to deal with that. Any objections they come up with, if you've scripted your response, you know how to react to it, gives you confidence. Now, the worst thing you do, we talked about before, the worst thing you can do is get defensive. If you get defensive, now you're, you're fighting and, and uh, you've lost it. Look at an, uh, 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 excuse me, look at, at an objection as a buying signal. If it's important enough to them to say, what about this, as a buying sign, they're still interested. If they weren't interested, they'd say, okay, that's a, they're out the door. But if they're interested enough to come up with an objection, that's a buying sign. What's the biggest objection you get? You haven't none? No. <laughs> Everybody come here. She's giving a seminar next week. Probably the first thing you're going to say is the price objection. It costs too much. Okay? See? I already caught you. <laughs> the best way, say me, my price is too high. Say that to me. Say your price is too high. My price is too high? If you reflect back that, that's a little technique, it puts them on the position where they have to explain what they're saying. Now, you go, if you're not comfortable with that, I mean, right, when I said that to you, you're saying, well, going, <clears throat> well, you're now going to explain to me why you said that. If you're not comfortable with that, you can say, well, what do you mean by that? My price is too high? Why do you mean by that? Um, if they're comparing you to the guy uh, with the lawn sign that's working out of his garage, at the very least, you can come up, this, this is on our blog, is, is how to buy the cheapest granite countertops. Uh, again, if you don't have this, I, I, it's on our blog, uh, clipstainless.net, or I'd be happy to email, give me your card, I'd be happy to mail it to you. Starts out with, don't ask for insurance, um, don't visit the shop where your countertops are being made, uh, don't ask for references. At the very least, if you you know, if you're selling it and you get something like this, or make up your own list of what to look for, insurance certificate, bonding, you know, uh, uh, resources to uh, cover the warranty. You may not get the project, but you know what, you're going to make that garage guy's life a lot more difficult. So uh, that's a great way to overcome the price objection. I had a customer, was a great customer for a long time, and when the the market started to turn, he put up a sign, $30 a square foot grant out in front of the shop. I still call on him four years later, I still call on him, he hadn't bought a sink in four years. And I called him and I, and I always talked to him and I said, you know, what's going on? He said, I hate all my customers. They only want to buy price. And I said, well, you think maybe the $30 a square foot, you know, maybe you're bringing in price only buyers? Oh, no, no, they're all that way, that doesn't matter, because I don't sell for $30 anyway. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, for $30 you only get this pink and this blue. So not only is he bringing in price-oriented buyers, but when they come in, he's not selling them that $30 price. So he's offending them. You know, upselling uh, bait and switch is not a good way to build rapport with your customers. Okay? So overcoming price is possible. I read a lot of articles, and most will tell you that five out of six customers will buy quality if you give them the opportunity. Now maybe in this market that has changed, but it's still the majority will buy quality if you give them the opportunity and the reason and the logical reason to buy quality. And finally you have to ask for the business. Um, closing. I hate the term closing because it implies you have to trick the customer into buying from you. They even have names. 
Um, if you make a list of all the benefits of buying your product, and because you've talked about it for two hours, it's, it's this long. And then you make a list of the disadvantages, it's only this long because you haven't talked about the disadvantages, right? It's called the ben Benjamin Franklin clothes. All your alternative clothes. Would you like that delivery on Tuesday or Thursday? Okay. Either way, they make it. <coughs> you didn't know, but you get that all the time. Would you like to pay cash or charge? All the time. On small purchases, if you're in the store and you're buying a tie and somebody says cash or charge, well, okay. You know, it, it's a, but in a countertop, a car, a house, big purchases, the customer's gonna be much more aware of that. They may feel manipulated and now it's gonna turn off the customer. Um, there's even the uh, pending event close. Price goes up on Monday. All those closes, the customers have caught up on, on to them, and so they may hurt you. So here's how I would close. Again, you've done the presentation, you come. You told me you wanted A, B, and C, and you did X to me A, and Y to me B, and go right down the list everything you did. And you told me your budget was between eight and ten thousand dollars, and our price is eighty nine fifty six. What would you like to do now? Soft sell. Um, they they. They're not threatened by it. <coughs> say that. What would you like to do now? And there's other ways you can do it. I mean, you can say, uh, uh, how would you like to proceed? Uh, uh, the assumptive close, assume they've already made the decision to buy. Uh, but um, at that point, if you say, what do you want to do now? They're either going to say, well, let's write up the order, or they're going to tell you some more objections, and then you've got to start over. But at least you've got it. The worst thing is that, well, we want to go home and think about it. That's the worst thing, okay? Because they don't go home and think about it. So, the customer says, I want to go home and think about it. Says, oh, I understand, this is a huge purchase. When you say, I understand, it puts them completely off guard because everybody else is trying to talk them out of going home to think about it. So, I understand, this is a big purchase, it's an important purchase. You, sh you should carefully consider it. Can I ask what you're going to be considering while you think about it? Okay. That helps you figure out, is there an issue that you need to deal with right now? Now, this is not perfect. I said that, uh, you know, if you start on Monday and do your top prices by Tuesday afternoon, you have a top. You can do absolutely everything right and not make a sale. And you can do everything absolutely wrong and that customer buys from you anyway. But if you do everything right, at the right time for the right reason, you got a better chance. Okay, once you get the order, you have to deliver the product memorably. And I think I've said that you may have to do it so they want, uh, so they don't think they made it. Every customer, as soon as they, the buyer's remorse, every, as soon as they sign the contract, they're worried that they screwed up. Okay, so when you do it, you have to deliver it so memorably that they want to tell all their friends, hey, this was a great week. We were worried about it, but it worked, and it was great. And then you have to follow up and get your referrals. Follow up by getting, you know, with the, with the uh, maintenance instructions and all the things. Follow up and get your referrals. So maybe surprise this lasted this long. Um, that covers the basic material I wanted to cover today. I, I do want to say that uh, you can't go to one seminar and suddenly become a sales expert. Okay? There are hundreds and thousands of uh, books. Some of them you can find on the back of this book that we're going to hand out. Uh, list some of the great uh, uh, sales books out there. Uh, I've been doing this for 30 years. Uh, I, I, I learn every day. You can't just go to a seminar, you can't listen to a book or read a book, although that's the best book. Uh, you have to practice, practice, practice. It's like jazz. I mean, I can give you a saxophone and I can give you music, but that doesn't mean you can play jazz. You have to learn the music, you have to learn to read the music, and then you have to learn not to re just to read the music, but to, to play the feel and the, you know, to make it yours. And the same thing with sales. You have to practice, practice, practice. Okay. Uh, I don't know what time is it. What time do we have? 11.56. Oh, we got four minutes for questions. Although I don't think there's anybody here, but if anybody wants to get the line. And any questions we can... I have a question. Yes. Yeah, what is the best answer 
How much is your square foot? I hate that question. Yeah. How much is your square foot? I don't know. Okay? That's the answer. Yeah. Okay. When I build houses, people wanted to buy houses by the square foot. And if you think it's ridiculous on granite, it's even more ridiculous on a house when you got 500 components instead of just a few. The best way is I don't know. I don't. I have to. I have to understand what you're trying to do, what you're looking to do, what you're trying to accomplish. Without the question and answer period, you have nothing. No. Price per square foot. I don't price per square foot because I don't know how you're going to use it. I don't know what colors you want. I got 50 square feet. How much is four square feet? My kitchen. That's what is direct question all the time. I understand, you know, and I don't the answer that long. You know what? Well, it really depends on your layout, how we're going to. You know what? Because 50 square feet, you know, it still might take two and a half slabs. Yes. You know, I mean. That's what I do too, but it's kind of. Shape of I'm the kind of bubbling about. It. I would like to have a nice, quick. Something was going to be the, nice. The to best way and, is I don't know because I don't know what your kitchen looks like. I don't know what you want. I have to. We have to get deeper in and figure out exactly what you want to understand it. Now, the problem is, my problem as a salesperson is not the fact that I'm not professional. It's because the salesman that was in there before me was so bad that when I walk in, they think I'm sleazy and whatever you say and pushy. Okay? They think I'm going to be sleazy and pushy because the guy before me was. You've got the same problem with. Per square foot, it's not you; it's the guy before you, and so you have to. I've got all these things in your countertop. Okay, I don't know. I don't. I, I can't price it per square foot because I don't know what I'm doing. Usually, my answer is like, you know what? I don't want to just overprice you or give you the low price. I have to know exactly. I have to know what you got, but I don't know, like you know, some. You um, have to get them in <clears throat> now. Nothing is a worse commodity than sinks. Okay. If it works right and I work my process right, I get people want my sinks before they ask me the price. Doesn't happen often because you're right, the first thing. But you have to work your process. Now, if that guy is only interested in the square foot price, it's not your customer anyway. One of, one of the other outs that was thrown out by a fabricator is the quality of the stone, which is rarely discussed. There are absolutely a serious difference in the grade of stone you get. So an easy way out of that square footage price is you can go at it and this one customer goes, well, you got a choice here. I've got Uba tube I can buy for $600 a slab, and I've got Uba tube I can buy for $2,500 a slab. So if you have a two slab job, look at the cost difference there. First we have to establish what we're doing and the level of stone you're willing to purchase. I can get you commercial grade stone. If you're selling your house, it's great. And I can get you slabs $10,000 that are gemstone. First let's land on the design. Then let's look at your budget and pick out the type of stone. And that takes you away from the square footage, but what that also does is if a guy comes in $2,000 less than you and you just said, well, I can get a tube at $600 and I can get a tube at $2,500, there's a $4,000 difference right there. So the price difference issue goes away, and now you just put fear and doubt into the type of stone they're buying. Say, well, hey, we all pay the same price for the stone. It's the same quality stone. So... By telling them the difference in the grade of the stone and the variance in the price for the exact same color, now all of a sudden, boom, now they're going, well, what was that other guy quoting me? Yeah. You create fear and doubt in the quality of the product they're providing, and that gets you out of the hole and gets you in the house. Let's get the layout, then let's talk about the quality of stone you're interested in purchasing, because up until two years ago, I didn't even realize there was that much of a variance in the quality of stone, how much filler and... Yeah. polish and grind and hide all the fissures and it just, it, it, it's just amazing the difference in the quality of stone and that's an easy out. The answer, I guess the answer to your question, the biggest thing is you got to get the discussion away from price. Well, if you right can't right. get the discussion away from price, then it's not your buyer. Got it. Thank you. Anything else? Well, I must have done a wonderful job. You did. You did. <laughs> <laughs> As you go out, we have sell, uh, uh, selling stone countertops, uh, a guy, it's the book for uh, people who hate sales, so they're free back there. Uh, tell your friends. We have more at our Eclipse booth if somebody comes in. If you'd like any of the mail, uh, the, the, the things, the, um, uh, leave me your card with your email on it. I'd be happy to email it to you.